as Kay said, my name is Bailey Reitzel. I have been talking to these folks over here about this, but I've been in crypto since 2012. Started out as a reporter in the space, um, have worked at a variety of mainstream media pubs, and also crypto pubs like Coindesk, but now I am in events and help put on events like this one that you're seeing here. I wanna start out this session by talking about what my building blocks are in crypto. Um, you know, first of all, CoinGecko, I look at every morning to decide what kind of mood I wanna be in. Is it good? Is it bad? And that is based on the color of the numbers that I see. My next one is a whole host of decentralized and centralized exchanges where I do some retail therapy, depending on what Again, the colors of those numbers are. And then of course, there is crypto Twitter. And so I can get a shot of drama in my day and know what is going on in crypto. But let's talk about some of these other building blocks. Um, beside me here, I have Sarah. She is a dev advocate at FBM Developer Experience. Um, I have Vuk here. He is the founder of Philmine. And then I have Hyder. He is the C CMO of OKX. So I wanna start out this conversation by sort of figuring out like where you all sit as a building block. So Sarah, I'll sort of start with you. Um, you know, FVM is pretty new in the Filecoin ecosystem. Yeah. So sort of take us through why Filecoin decided to build a smart contract layer and why, you know, why smart, smart contracts are sort of a building block for this ecosystem. Yeah, um, thanks Bailey. So I'll kind of start with why I think smart contracts are the building block of the Web3 ecosystem. So if you, you know, like what Juan shared earlier on, we have what we try to do in the Web3 is to provide like a decentralized version of what Web2 has to offer. And so today we have a lot of networks and storage networks set up, but we're not fully at the point where we are computing the same way that Web2 does. And so what I think smart contracts are able to do is to provide that layer, where we can, we can build like dApps, we can build applications, and basically anything you imagine, which is what Web2 offers to you today, but then now we are able to do it decentrally in Web3. And so I think it's really important. Um, what I think the FBM is there to do and why we're adding it on right now is because we've built the foundation, right? So now we have a really robust Filecoin storage and retrieval market. And so what we want to do is to add general programmability on top of that and allow people to build apps that can run and compute um, over state data within the, F within the Filecoin ecosystem, which makes it much more effective. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of exciting stuff to come. And so I'm gonna move on to you as well at Philmine. Like how is this the building block of maybe Filecoin and then also the broader crypto ecosystem? Yeah, so Filecoin is basically uh, the fundamental resource uh, infrastructure. So basically it's allowing us to tap into massive storage resources, but there are gonna be like many layers on top of Filecoin that are gonna allow other uh, participants to contribute in the network in uh, different ways. So what we are trying to do is uh, use that first layer on top of Filecoin as the layer that makes the entire experience of providing resources to the network easier. In the case of storage providers, that is by allowing storage providers to tap into liquidity pools provided by people staking, so basically a liquid staking protocol. But also we are trying to decouple the compute and storage roles in the Falcon ecosystem. If you think about miners today, they are doing a couple of roles. One is doing the storage, which is basically sending proof to the network that they actually have some storage stored. Uh, the second one is they are doing a lot of computing for the ceiling. Uh, and the third one is being basically traders that are betting on when uh, the, the price of the token is gonna go up or down. So what we're trying to do is decouple those roles in a way that storage providers think only about storage, compute providers think only about compute, and uh, token holders think only about tokens. And uh, that's in our opinion the first uh, building block, the first layer, and there are gonna be like many use cases on top, like using those compute providers for not just uh, ceiling, but also for other computing networks and then like bridging uh, the computing network with the uh, IPFS and Falcon ecosystem. I mean, do you see, so I'm gonna stay with you just quickly. Do you see those groups overlapping though? Like storage providers, our token holders are, you know, are, is there a lot of overlap or no? Uh, there is some overlap, but like naturally, uh, if we think about the long term, it's not gonna be like a, a very big overlap because like if you are focused on infrastructure and your business is providing storage infrastructure, you want to do that. So if you want to go to hyperscale, you need to do that pretty well. And then you don't want to be blocked by the other things. So like if it also requires massive amounts of liquidity, uh, then you are bottlenecked by the liquidity. Right. And what we want is to allow you to focus on one thing very well and do it uh, uh, the best you can. And uh, with that, like have other people contribute on the other parts that are important for providing storage at this point. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And then Haider, I want to pass it over to you just to sort of like level set where OKX is in a building block of Web3. So uh, I think for OKX, we like to think ourselves, uh, of ourselves as the front end of most of these experiences. So we listed Filecoin way back in 2020. I was just this morning looking at some of the numbers and we still have about a half a million people roughly who hold Filecoin. And the interesting trends on our side that we see for Filecoin as it relates to adoption is it's mostly people who are actually not crypto natives. It's people who are attracted to the mining incentives and rather come into crypto being a miner than a trader or an investor. So we saw a lot of early adoption for people who were actually interested in the hardware play and wanting to become miners and take, uh, participate in that in the incentive pool. And we've seen that behavior continue. Like we still have people who are actually signing up and uh, you know, buying Filecoin and then participating in the ecosystem. So for us, the way we contribute to the building blocks is create the most simple UI for people to come in, access these markets in a very you know, easy way and then be able to discover what Filecoin and its ecosystem has to offer. Yeah, I, that's a great segue because I wanted to talk about user experience because I think it's a very important you know, part of creating these building blocks. So maybe it's not the building block, but in creating it, you have to have a good user experience. And I have not personally used OKX. Um, I'm in the US and I, I don't know how, I don't think I can use. You can. OKX, okay. So uh, OKX has gone through some evolution recently. So okay. we were known as the, the legacy CFI exchange. We've been around since 2017. And recently what we did was we actually are the only exchange with two distinct modes. So you're able to seamlessly go from a CFI experience into DeFi. It's a self-hosted wallet. You're able to use that self-hosted wallet in the United States. And you can access our NFT marketplace, the DEX aggregator. There's a DAP discovery engine. Those are the utilities that you can use in the United States. You're not able to use any of the trading software. Yeah, it's, I was looking around on OKX, so now I'm gonna start using it probably, because really you're, the protocol, it looks pretty good. Um, and you have like a lot of learn content, which actually was pretty helpful. So I guess, you know, I, I want you to also talk about like why you decided to build that out and how that, you know, how hard that is to keep updated and to keep fresh for your users. So I'm assuming you're talking about learn. Uh, learn, the idea when we actually launched it a couple of years ago, was to give uh, the ability for new entrants to come in and not be intimidated by crypto. So what happens typically is we are in our own echo chamber and we know these technologies, we know the nomenclature, we know how the, these things work, but for anyone new into crypto, it just blows their mind. They don't know where to start. So the education that we try to create was simplify everything to the lowest common denominator and let anyone, like even somebody like my mom and dad coming in and being able to read this stuff and understand and put their heads around it. Yeah, for sure. And I think us in Web3, one of the things I notice is we have such a high bar in terms of bad user experience. You know, like we'll go through a lot of hoops to get into crypto. So um, yeah, I, I, we're working on it. I guess, Vuk, if you'll talk about um, how you have designed the user experience for your storage provider clients. Yeah, I, I think in Web3, like user experience is a bit different than what we are used to in Web2. So like in Web3, it's about like thinking about the roles in this uh, ecosystem and trying to like think of who should be doing what. Uh, and it's also important to understand that we are just in the beginning. So like uh, this is maybe the second year of Falcon. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is decentralized computing. So we are trying to basically build a cloud infrastructure that is decentralized. Uh, and this has not be, been done before, and like uh, very few teams are actually working on this. So thinking about like how we are going to get there, it's basically by uh, having like a different like uh, abstractions for the different roles, and those are going to be protocols. Those are not going to be some fancy UI that they use. Those are going to be protocols that somehow interact together. If we zoom out and we think about how the centralized computing is going to work, most likely what you're going to have is you're going to be interacting with a computing network that is focused on a particular job. For example, that could be Lightyear. Uh, Lightyear is focused on encoding, and what you do is you use Lightyear and the abstractions that Lightyear built for encoding. That workload, when it gets scheduled, is gonna happen somewhere. You're not even, uh, know where it's gonna happen if you don't define where it's gonna happen, but you could possibly define that, and some miner can actually decide whether to execute that computing workload or not. 
So it's going to be like many abstractions that uh, some of them should be visible to the end user, but most likely uh, very few of them will. Uh, and it's more about thinking all those layers that are going to be allowing us to get to that experience and having that computing workload actually execute on a machine at the end of the day. So, yeah, we are thinking more in terms of like how we actually make the things simple for like more people, and we have like uh, incentives aligned for each of the uh, stakeholders rather than thinking about how to build a nice UX. Of course, you also need a, a UX to show like that those people are really participating there, and this is where explorers come in, because if you don't have explorers, then like people are not aware that there is actually traction there, and that there are actually miners that can execute your workloads. Yeah, and we're gonna go through Filgram here in a little bit, um, because I wanna walk through it, because when I look at the Explorer, I'm not sure what I'm looking at either, and I bet like a lot of people in this room would love to sort of know. Um, but to Sarah, to jump to you, in terms of how you're seeing developers of FEM, are, are they thinking about user experience, or would they rather think about some of these like, I don't know, maybe like tougher, if that's the right word, problems? Um, so I think on the point of UX, we are a few phases away from it. Um, I would, you know, to be frank, I think right now UX is not so much for, let's say, a consumer user the same way OKX would have. It's more for developers who are highly technical. Um, but we are guiding them along, right? And we are trying to grow the ecosystem as well. So there's a lot of resources that we're creating right now for people that are maybe new to Web3. Um, maybe you are a Solidity dev, you've built a few use cases, but you want to try deploying EVM to FEM, you want to try using FEM itself. Um, we're having a lot of resources to help scale that out. So we are helping people to walk through the process from beginner all the way to more of an expert. Um, so that's, that's the best UX that we have at this point. But where our builders uh, who are actively building right now are focused on is really building and getting the infrastructure right. Um, there, we have like multiple test nets open right now. We have the Wallaby test net. We're also coming off an incentivized test net in a few months. And that's really for these technical devs to go in and try, break things. Um, so, you know, see how it works out for them and then be able to advocate for that or to build out, for example, for FBM's case, um, we have a lot of actors which are equivalents of smart contracts. And so by having these early builders in there, they can build a lot of these reference cases that then other developers can just take very easily and then adapt it for their own needs. And so that builds up the UX over time. So that's how we're looking at it right now. Yeah, nice. Okay. Um, and because we're in Singapore, I want to sort of level set in terms of how um, different markets have different building blocks. So, Haider, I'm going to start with you. I mean, in, in an Asian market, are you seeing the building blocks differ based uh, compared to like a more Western market? How do those like cultural differences mean that you have to build products? So, it's, it's tough to generalize, of course, but Macro trends that we see is the, the customers or the uh, you know, retail investors or even developers uh, in the Asia market tend to embrace complexity a little better than you know, folks in, in the Western market. So I'll give you a very simple analogy. Here, you can have one super app that does everything for you. Whereas, you know, it's funny, if you type in Grab, you'll get an ad for Uber Eats and there's Uber under it. And they're two separate apps. So I think culturally speaking, uh, it feels to us that the consolidation of services is much more accepted in the Asia markets than in, in the United States or Western markets. People like to have independent applications and simplify their UX and how they enter into different experiences. They really want to control that. But again, it's a macro generalization. People like everything everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it, does that change how you, I guess, market those products then? Uh, I think we start with the lowest common denominator on our side, assuming that most of the 7 billion people in the world actually don't know what we're doing or what we're talking about. So we start from that point and reverse back. Uh, and, and I think the, the part where we try and speak with natives, people who are actually aware of this technology, is more in our life cycle and our go-to-market efforts. We target them very specifically. But when we go broad, we try and you know, message to the lowest common denominator. I gotcha. And then, Vuk, for you, um, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the differences between these markets? Um, maybe uh, tell us like where nodes are set up, um, storage provider nodes around the world, and like you know how that changes what those what those folks can do. Yeah, I, I don't think the, the building blocks are changing. What's changing is uh, which role do you uh, decide to take in that particular ecosystem? So of course, we might see like more infrastructure providers in Asia, because this is naturally how Asia was set up. And Asia is basically like the, the infrastructure that the entire world is currently using for a lot of things, not just uh, computer infrastructure. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to have the same protocols, and this is the beauty of uh, Web3, because everyone can participate in those, and everyone can decide which role to take. So the building blocks are the same. We are just participating in those ecosystems in, in a different way. OK. And Sarah, did you, did you want to add to that? Are you seeing like differences between markets um, in terms of developers coming? Not really. I think the caliber is really high for those developers that are coming to us. And they come from all different parts of the world. I think one thing that our team is aiming to, to do better on is to be more inclusive of different teams coming from different areas. Like, can we provide more resources in different languages over time so that we can support building across the world? Because obviously, Asia has a lot of interest and a lot of great devs out there as well. So we want to be able to support that. Yeah. And actually, Vuk, I wanted to ask you, you know, you, I, I saw that there's nodes set up in China, and China has, you know, typically been a bit uh, standoffish to the crypto space. Um, and so does that, you know, does that worry you um, that nodes are based there? Do those get, sh can they maybe be shut off? Like, how does that work? Uh, we need to be very neutral. So like, uh, we need to show what's on the chain. So like, we are not really talking to those uh, storage providers. Uh, we see that they are based in China. And uh, this is why we, we show that they are in China. Uh, also, like generally, if you think about providing storage, uh, it's very questionable whether that's mining or not. Mining is more associated to like using a lot of electricity and doing uh, proof of work mining uh, for Ethereum, Bitcoin, and so on. And I think there is like a, just a bad sap where like uh, regulators were not educated enough to actually understand what kind of miners there are. Yeah. And, and I think like. Uh, we try to tackle that by actually changing the name of a miner to a provider of something, a storage provider, a compute provider. Uh, but maybe that was a bit too late. But if you think about uh, what's going on is that basically particular uh, uh, personas in a, a region are not able to do a particular job. Like uh, uh, that would be like not having Ali Cloud or AWS in China. That, that, that's a bit tricky because this is where we want to get. And uh, those uh, uh, people are actually just providing storage. They are not really mining. But mining was a term that was uh, historical for Bitcoin. And actually, being node in a network was kind of always called as mining. And uh, that's kind of why we got in that situation. But uh, yeah, I don't f think it worries us. It's more about how we actually educate those regulators by showing that there is actually a lot of useful data stored, that there is a lot of useful computing uh, being stored. And as well, something important to understand is that decentralized storage allows those governments to have like independence. If, uh, if you're using AWS, you don't have independence. Like, and most of the organizations in Asia probably can't use AWS because a lot of that is uh, dependent on what uh, is decided in a different uh, jurisdiction. So it is much better for local governments to actually accept decentralized storage and try to actually work with uh, the technology providers towards gang to a point where there is some understanding and uh, there is some education being done. Uh, but we are like in a tricky spot right now. Yeah, uh, Haider, I want to pass that to you as well, because I think regulation is sort of like a building block or, you know, it's like some ground that you have to then build these things on. How does OKX sort of think about the regulatory space and like making sure regulators are uh, up to date and not aggressively against crypto and what you're doing? I think it's, this is a great time for us to be building relationships with policymakers. So we're trying to lean in and help them. And you help them not when you actually have an agenda. You try and help them proactively when you can actually add value to their agendas. So at a local level, what we're trying to do is build those relationships, influence policy in each of the markets. Of course, this is much relevant to our C5 business than it is to the Web3 side of things. Sure. But even on the Web3 side of things, we've been working with New York and the policymakers in New York recently to educate them about Web3 and the potential, the business opportunities it brings to the states and otherwise. So I think this is a time where whether you're in CFI or DeFi, you have to embrace regulations. They will come. Hopefully, they're common sense regulations. And I think it's on us, it's on all of us to be able to influence and, and actually be vocal about it and educate people who you know, our policymakers maybe are very detached from our world on what are the ultimate utilities these things bring and how they empower the, you know, the 7 billion people in the world who get to use these uh, technologies, whether it's for, you know, avoiding censorship in some markets, whether it's access to internet and information. There's a lot of utility that 
that people are able to uh, get from crypto ecosystems. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear these conversations because let's say like in 2012, 2013, I was also on stage with people and they were saying, you know, crypto will never be regulated. It can never be regulated. And so it's so interesting to hear how this conversation has shifted so greatly um, because we do see that on the outside of the crypto ecosystem, you surely can regulate it um, or at least put enough pressure on, on users and businesses that they don't want to operate in those areas. I think, I think in the early days of crypto, there was also this very overly indexed libertarian view. And that government should not have a role in, sure. in this you know, new system, so to speak. But the reality is, if it's a financial market, it ought to be regulated. And yes, that might be a controversial point of view coming from <laughs> yeah, somebody who works boo. at a C5 thing. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think it's, as long as it's good common sense regulations that don't prohibit innovation, uh, that don't drive innovation out uh, and actually welcome this new utility and don't get scared of it, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Because yeah. there are a lot of people who don't know what they're doing in these markets and they can lose their shirt very quickly. I mean, I've been in the space for 10 years and I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. <laughs> so, like, that's really fair. Yeah. Um, all right, I want to come back to Sarah, um, not to talk about regulation, but to give us, like, a real-world use case for FVM. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about this as the two of them were talking because clearly, you know, Vuk's use case is very much for storage providers and Haida's use case is very much for consumers. And I'm thinking, like, how do I show the FVM, which is very much in its infancy, to people out there and what does it mean to them today? Um, I think the best use case that you can think about it, and I'll use the example of NFT storage right now, which sure. uh, helps power OpenSea. So what FVM can do for it is it can really help to enhance a marketplace. So think of, of any mar marketplace. If your data is being stored on the Falcon ecosystem, you could have compute running over that, and you can deploy smart contracts, which we call actors, um, to help enhance that and automate a lot of the processes within that. So things, for example, like reputation, uh, making a trustless reputation, you might be able to take out a lot of the processes to make sure that your storage provider, for example, your the person that is compiling your deals, right, is somebody that you can trust. Um, you could help to have, you could trigger um, deal repairs, you could trigger, for consumers especially, deal renewals. So if you start something on there, you know, you're hitting like one year mark, you forget, you know, you're on holiday and then you come back and it's gone, that would suck, right? So if we automate those processes, it will make it much easier for you. And so you will come very close to what you see today in, for example, your shopping marketplaces, right? If that is on a decentralized network eventually. So that's a really strong use case for consumers, I would think. And for developers out there, I would think that uh, it's in its infancy, but what I would say as like, you know, some closing words on it is that Falcon today is one of the biggest storage networks out there, right? And we are so lucky that we have this compute mechanism being built on there. So come in early because this is really going to be a game-changing thing. Um, and I think it's a really great point to start because a lot of people don't know a lot of things and there will be a lot of people to help you along the way rather than when it gets more mature and then you're like, whoa, there's just so much to absorb right now. So yeah, it's a perfect time to start. Okay, I want to do the Phil Graham walkthrough. So I'm going to go up to the podium and Hopefully, we can put that on the screen. Um, and Vuk, you can sort of take us through what, what we're looking at here. So like, Phil Graham is the block explorer for Filecoin. Um, so like, just walk me through some of these numbers. Like, what am I looking at here? Yeah, so we are basically showing storage providers that are, that are providing storage uh, in the world right now. So we, we are just displaying the active ones, so they're, and uh, the ones that are doing verified uh, storage deals. So there are also like another uh, 3,000 uh, ones that are not doing verified storage deals and uh, that have not uh, recently added uh, storage to the network, so we are not displaying those. But if you uh, just uh, remove like the, the active uh, filter, uh, yeah, yeah. you yeah. would uh, actually see those ones as well, uh, which is 4,300. Oh, right, right. Now, uh, if you look at what we are showing here, maybe for yeah, Blue Limited, we are basically showing the particular data center and we are showing the storage provider. The storage provider is the entity be behind some particular machines uh, and we have the notion of a data center and the storage provider. So you're now looking at a data center that is uh, being uh, managed by that particular storage provider. So if you click there, you should be able to see all the storage deals that uh, that particular storage provider with that particular uh, data center has made, if you click on, on that, uh, that card. Oh, boy. It was not cached Holding, in please. Asia. <laughs> okay, okay, so you can see, like, uh, 
uh, the storage deals here. And you can see that uh, uh, that particular storage provider is making a verified storage deals. The way you see that is verified is by actually looking at uh, the blue badge next to the uh, deal ID. And uh, yeah, you can see the size, you can see the, the start of the epoch, uh, end of the epoch, uh, and so on. You can also go to the storage provi provider profile, and you're gonna see more information now about that particular storage provider. So in this particular case, the storage provider just left some general information about themselves. Uh, they could also leave like uh, a broader description with uh, uh, through like a markdown format, but this is just an example. Awesome, yeah, that was actually super helpful. So you would basically look through this to figure out like what storage provider you wanna go with? Uh, yeah, you would search for a storage provider in a particular region. You I could see. potentially look for a storage provider with some particular certificate. If you're in Europe, you maybe want some ISO certificate. Uh, you want a, a storage provider to be in a particular region. For example, if you're in Germany, you need to store all your financial records in Germany. So you would definitely want a storage provider that is based in Germany. And then you will find that storage provider. And then there is also another option for you to contact that storage provider if you log in. And you can also ask multiple storage providers at the same time to store a particular data set uh, by actually logging in and using uh, the matchmaking uh, a program that was built. Nice, okay. We are out of time, but I wanna do like very short one last question, because in terms of building blocks, is there something that Web3 is missing right now that still needs to be built? Um, Sarah, I'll start with you. Although maybe you need to, <laughs> nope, starting with Hyder, she needs to think. Um, oh, I got I it, think I got it. Oh, okay, oh, okay, you wait, she's got please it. Please go for it. <laughs> uh, so to the point of UX, um, yeah. as somebody that has come into Web3 pretty recently, um, getting better UX eventually for people to come in and understand it is something that we really need. Totally, 100%, Vuk? Uh, er everything needs to be built. So uh, <laughs> if you think uh, where we wanna get, and probably this is gonna be like five, six years effort, is uh, doing everything that AWS can do. Uh, so if you go to AWS, you log in, and you see each of the individual products, all of those are most likely gonna be computing networks, and all of that needs to be built. Uh, the FEM is just coming out, so all the layers of protocols that I mentioned need to be built, and if it wasn't for the FEM, we wouldn't be able to build protocols ourselves. And we think that we are just like the first layer of infrastructure on uh, the FEM. Other layers of infrastructure are gonna be there. Maybe some people will wanna uh, stake their tokens into more risky miners, and because of that, they uh, need to get uh, higher yields. Uh, and uh, building those things is gonna be super important for the network, and all of that needs to be built. Amazing. Haider? I think for me, it would be the identity layer. Uh, creating a, a universal one. identity system that can work across different Web3 applications. Uh, and I think if anyone can solve the self-hosted wallet issue of having to save your seed phrase, I think that would be my, my yes. top pick. Here, here for that one, for sure. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. That was super interesting about building blocks. Thank you all for your attention, and another session will be up shortly. Thank you, guys.